What's in a name? Meaning, identity, mission, emotion, purpose. We've heard a lot about Polaris. Ember's next edition, and North Star. Traveling to distant stars is no trivial feat, but to help with this, we're excited to announce that Ember Data is going universal. Universal means that Ember Data will work equally well with or without any JavaScript framework, with or without a DOM, in any JavaScript runtime, with standard build tools, and with any version of Ember. This is made possible in part because of the Embroider initiative and made easier by the efforts to standardize signals in TC39. Signals are a broader ecosystem term for Ember's tracked concept. And you should make sure to listen to Dan's talk later today to learn a lot more about that standardization work. So what's stopping us from being universal? Not much. In Canary, every package now uses Ember's v2 add-on format enabling them to be built with any bundler, including Vite. The entire list of work that remains to go universal is very short, and we expect universal Ember data to be available before the end of the year. Last year, we presented the new foundation for Ember data we've been building to help us reach for the stars, recentering the library around request management, embracing the platform, and providing greater flexibility and broader utility. Adapters and serializers became builders and handlers that decorate the platform fetch API. Models became schemas, and now in Canary, schema record. Ember's legacy proxies have been removed in favor of native proxies, meaning that arrays are now just arrays instead of custom array-like interfaces to separately learn. Promise proxies and RSVP proxies are now just native promises. We chose to slow the rate of releases to allow us to craft the best possible bridge from version 4.12 to version 5. For each change, we've worked to build a robust migration path with multiple paths for incremental adoption and code mods where possible. One significant change is that we now publish all of Ember Data's packages with a second mirror name so that you can install and use two versions at once as part of your migration strategy. We still have a few kinks to work out, but combined with the work to become universal and to decouple from Ember Source, we believe this will give nearly all apps the ability to incrementally migrate to the latest version, no matter what version of Ember Source and Ember Data they use today. Be sure to listen to Kirill's talk later. He'll dive into some of these migration paths. Speaking of Kirill. We couldn't have made the progress we have this past year without the efforts of Kristen, Rich, and Kirill. All three have been tricked into joining the Ember Data core team alongside me. So thank you very much. To celebrate the progress that we've made, the mission that this project has embarked on, we think it's time that we took on a new name, one that fits our purpose, universal a library not tied to any framework, decoupled from Ember, but still Ember first, with a mission to empower application journeys that span decades, to help you deliver faster than ever, sits at the core of the products we engineer, at the heart of what makes our apps fast, and gives us back the time to explore new frontiers of UX. Introducing Warp Drive. Logistically, the project will move to its own org. We will continue to be governed by the Ember.js project and use the Ember.js RC process, using the same trusted guarantees for stability, stewardship, and open governance. Guides and docs for now are unchanged, though we may ship a standalone doc site in the future. You will continue to be able to install all current Ember data packages under the Ember data name in perpetuity. While some packages will eventually be renamed, we will continue to publish those packages under their old name for convenience. And importantly, support for Ember will continue to be first class. Anything specific to Ember will be available via the new Warp Drive Ember library. 
and that is universal data. Universal, but still Ember first. So let's take a peek at what's new for Ember. We're introducing a feature we call Reactive Control Flow. Reactive utilities for working with promises and requests. Warp Drive's intent is to provide patterns that prioritize app performance and user experience. For example, reducing fetch waterfalls and decreasing load times. But we don't want to do that at the expense of good developer experience. To that end, these reactive control flow utilities simplify patterns for working with both native promises and warp drive request futures. To do this, warp drive's request library exposes primitives to cache and retrieve the result of any promise without leaking memory. Because each JavaScript framework handles reactivity differently, these primitives are non-reactive by design. Instead, the primitives would be wrapped with framework-specific implementation of the reactive control flow feature patterns, or even using the proposed JavaScript signals API. This is EmberConf, so we'll be looking at examples from the Ember implementation. You can use these features now by installing Warp Drive Ember, which is compatible with both 4.12 and 5.3 versions of Ember data. During today's talk, when we're showing new features, we're going to show these Tomsters to indicate if the feature is coming soon, available in Canary releases, or available in stable releases. As shown on the previous slide, Warp Drive Ember is available as a stable release. These examples will show varying implementation of the same component. The user provider component, component requests and displays a filtered list of users based on a passed in filter argument. While the request is running, it shows a spinny wheel. When the request completes, results are yielded to the result block. And if the request errors, it displays the error message. The component signature for the user provider component will be the same in each of the implementations we are about to show. It takes a string filter as an argument and yields the resulting users list to a default block. The first implementation uses an old school Ember data query wrapped in an Ember concurrency task. If the request task is running, we display the spinny wheel. If it errors, we display the error. And if it's successful, we play we display the request task's last value. On the surface, the implementation seems simple, but we have an issue. In order to trigger a new request whenever the filter changes, we need to add an extraneous div element in order to hook up the did update filter modifier that triggers the request task. Here's the same component with the same features but converted to using the new Warp Drive Ember reactive control flow patterns. We're using a simple cached getter, so a new request will automatically be triggered whenever the filter changes. If the request promise is pending, we display the spinny wheel as before. If it errors, we display the error as before. And if it's successful, we display the result simply by yielding it from the success block. The await component wraps the query promise in a promise state. This is a reactive wrapper for a promise, which allows you to write declarative code around a promise's control flow. Under the hood, it calls a JavaScript function called getPromiseState, which you guessed it, gets the reactive promise state object for the given promise. In addition to using the await control flow component, you can also use get promise state directly in JavaScript contexts or even as a template helper. Let's revisit our user provider, this time upgrading the store.query to warp drive's new request and builder pattern while maintaining the same control flow logic. It's just a, a tiny syntax change, but there's another difference here. And this is the part that we hope will blow your mind. The return type for store.request is different than the return type of the old store.query. Instead of just a promise, store.request returns what we call a future. A future is a promise, but with two key extensions. First, futures provide access to a stream of their content. And second, futures can be aborted. 
These additional APIs allow us to craft even richer state experiences. As we know, the await component handles promises, which means it automatically handles futures as well. But we can switch to the request component to take advantage of futures additional features. Like the await component, the request component is built upon a reactive wrapper that allows you to write declarative code around a futures control flow. This time, the wrapper adds many, many more properties. We call this wrapper the request state. In addition to pending, error, and success states, you also get access to powerful loading state data and the ability to abort requests. All of this is powered by warp drive futures in the JavaScript Streams API. Let's revisit our user provider component, and I'll give you a rundown of some of the exciting features that request state and the request component provide. Again, the request will automatically be triggered whenever the filter changes. The pending block is now called the loading block. The error block remains the same. And the success block is now called the content block. You can now easily display information about the request completion state, such as the percent complete. You can now easily cancel requests with the state.abort method. And if a request is canceled, you now have access to a special cancellation state. Canceled and errored requests can be retried. When we retried, when we retry, if the Ember provide consume context library is installed, the request component will utilize the store <laughs> from the provided context, falling back to the store service if no context is provided. This means that you can run two stores in parallel during an iterative, iterative migration and know that the correct store will always be used. Remember to watch Kirill's talk about migrations and Kevin's talk about contextualizing state if you're interested in learning more about this feature. Back to the user provider we go. There's more features, so let's add them. Successful requests can be reloaded. In this case, the request state reset before the request is resent. Alternatively, successful requests can be refreshed. The existing request state will still be shown while the request is resent. You can even nest request within request so that you can request stuff while you request your requests. <laughs> In this case, we're using nested requests for more advanced handling of reloads. You can also set requests to auto refresh whenever the user clicks back into the browser window or tab, or when their network comes back online after being offline. Auto refresh equals true, done. I'm going on break. And finally, the stream itself is exposed for your consumption so that you can do whatever the heck you want. OK, back to our user provider. We've seen the multitude of features available using the request component, but there's one big issue that we haven't solved yet. What happens if the user list gets extremely long? We need pagination. So coming soon, we're making pagination easy. The paginate component will be a declarative control flow component along the lines of the await and request components. This component will understand the pagination links sent from your API. The paginate components API mimics request, but expands the possibilities to afford an extremely flexible toolbox for managing the state of any paginated flow you might want to build. All of the same top-level blocks are available for use, with their states specifically applying to the state of the initiating request passed into the component. And new blocks are added to manage the requests for the previous and next pages. Alternatively, you can use Paginate's default block which allows you to control the substates for individual loading pages. Let's take a look at some examples of how the paginate component will be used. 
Here, we use Paginate together with Vertical Collection to provide bidirectional infinite scroll. First, we show the loading state for the initial request. Then, when the user scrolls to the last item in the list, the pages.next method is invoked and the next page's loading state is shown. When they scroll to the first item on the list, the pages.prev method is invoked and the previous page's loading state is shown. If, instead of infinite scroll, you want to have links to the various pages, you can add the each link companion component. The each link companion component renders each available link or placeholder. Placeholders occur when it is known that a link could exist, but we have not yet received the link. The text property on the link will be a single dot in these cases. Here, we also use a nested request component to display the state of the active page request. Again, the paginate component is coming soon, but we hope you're looking forward to it as much as we are. And here's Chris with an inspiring remark. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, we're really excited about the story Warp Drive Ember offers uh, for refactoring and migrating data patterns. And as a new foundational primitive that we hope to incorporate into the next generation of routing for Ember applications. All right, let's talk about TypeScript. Warp Drive now offers native TypeScript support. What this means is that whether you use TypeScript or not, your IDE experience is soon going to improve dramatically. However, for those familiar with the Ember data types provided by Definitely Typed, there are some key differences to note. The biggest change is that warp drive types don't use registries. The trouble with registries is that for moderate to mid-sized applications, they just literally do not work. TypeScript triggers this error if certain union types hit a few hundred keys. That's not terribly hard to encounter. Registries don't scale. They don't compose well across application and library boundaries. They make it hard to juggle static class types versus instance types. And registries only have one type per key. And maybe we actually want more than one type signature. Instead of registries, we'll be using brands. Brands are properties on a type used specifically for shaping, narrowing, or passing additional type hints. In this case, we use the type symbol to brand this user class as the user resource type. Brands don't always need to exist as real properties, though in some cases it's useful if they do. Let's look at some of the scenarios that brands help us with. Here, we have a user model with a few attributes and relationships. To keep this example relatively simple, we only have one type of model, a user, and all of our relationships are to other users. If we wanted to type this model, we'd start with declaring the types of each property. And since our class has to handle existing, editing, and creating cases, we have to account for the scenarios where our fields might be null or undefined. While using arrays and promises for our relationships does work, we can provide a more specific type to give us more complete ty uh, types with more powerful TypeScript guarantees. And we can add type checking to the options of our transformed attributes by hinting through a generic. And finally, to be able to, to enable these advanced type checks and type support when working with stored model methods, we add a brand. If we were using stage three decorators, at this point we would be done. With stage three decorators, TypeScript will infer the record type from the field and use it to check the options supplied to has many belongs to. Until then though, we can ensure that our relations arguments are also type checked by just assigning the generic ourselves. So short term workaround. So that's a typed model. To this point, it should look and feel very similar to the models you typed using definitely typed, minus the registry, plus a brand. It'll be a bit more type safety than before. So let's look at using our user model, starting with a couple of the older legacy APIs. Here, we've created a new user record. Right away, we get our first type hint. Let's hover that and see what's going on. Oh, Chris is unknown. This makes sense because the store has no idea what kind of record we wanted to create, only that it was called a user. Let's give it a hint. Now Chris isn't unknown, 
but we've got two new errors. Let's check those out. Aha, the name property is incorrect. Let's fix that. Great. So we've created a new record. Let's take a look at querying. Here's the legacy approach to loading a user by ID. Here, once again, we get an error because user one is of type unknown. Let's fix it. Great. Now with types, we learned that pets is an invalid include since this is actually not one of our relationships. Let's fix that as well. With our brand approach, it becomes safer for us to attempt to validate relation paths like includes automatically because we're better able to control the type traversal depth and type union size. Now let's look at how this request looks like using the modern approach. Here, we're using a find record builder to construct a request. It knows our content is a user. Wait a minute, how does that work? We didn't pass a generic to request or tell it about its return type. The secret? Brands. Notice that we passed our user type into the find record builder. Builders are able to use brands to assign both the return type and the options type to the request method. This means builders can be used to construct robustly typed queries. But a very the lead. Because the type can be supplied by builders and flows to the generics and brands means we don't really need a class at all. Here's another way of looking at the same type of that user class. We can substitute this type for the user class in every example we've shown so far, and it would just work. This is something the registry approach wasn't flexible enough for, and it unlocks a massive feature set today, while also laying the groundwork for a robust end-to-end -end type story in the not-so-distant future. Not requiring a physical class especially matters for schema record, the replacement for model. Schema records don't have a class specific to their resource type. So to type them, we need a pure type, not a class. Let's look at some examples of what this unlocks today. Remember how we had to set all our values to be optional or null? Well, with the types approach, we can separate the type signatures for existing records from those for editable or newly created records. Here, we, uh, on the left, we have a signature for an existing record, and on the right, we have a signature for an editable user. This capability also means that we can type partials as partials without requiring a separate resource type for class. And it means that when we save a new record, we can upgrade the type of the result to account for the additional data that the API might have filled in for us. Or when we want to edit a record, it means that we could utilize a type signature specific to what fields are meant to be part of that edit. Which incidentally means that by combining builders and types, we can create typed reusable mutations pretty elegantly. But it doesn't end there. We're working towards enabling a query syntax that lints against your schemas and automatically assigns the correct type signature. This syntax would close the DX gap between well-specced REST APIs like JSON API and GraphQL without requiring your API to be implement a very specific architecture. So that's TypeScript. TypeScript support is currently Canary, and we're already using it in production at Audiboard with Ember Data version 4.12. There are two ways to install and use it. First, by installing Canary and configuring your app to use its types. Or, by installing the standalone types packages that we now publish, which we compile from our native types, and using those standalone types with an older release. Buyer beware. Using these types with older releases is likely better than using definitely typed, but you may encounter some friction or some invalid signatures. All right, enough about TypeScript. Here's Kristen again to talk about caching. Conveniently, Warp Drive caches your requests by default. This is done via the cache handler. The cache handler sits in front of your request handlers and intercepts requests that can be resolved immediately from the cache, making your app appear snappier. By default, all requests will be cached indefinitely unless manually refreshed. So the first time you make a request, the request will be sent to the request handlers and your app will wait for the response. The second time you make the same request, the response is returned immediately from the cache. Unless you configure the request with the reload cache option. 
With this option, the request will once again be sent to the request handlers and your app will await the response. And indeed, in this case, the response is different. A wild Yehuda appears. Or you can configure the request with the background reload cache option. With this option, the cache response will be returned immediately, but the request will still be spent, sent to the request handlers in the background. The cache and your UI will be updated with the new data once the new request resolves. When the user changes data by adding, updating, or deleting records, the new data is merged into the existing cache automatically while requests to save the changes are sent in the background. In this case, we're updating the Chris user, deleting the Kristen user, and adding a new Waldo user. Then, when we request the user's list again, we get our cached response. But wait, where is Waldo? For British people, that's Wally. Where's Wally? <laughs> While Waldo was indeed merged into the cache, we could access the Waldo user with a peak record or a peak all. Our users list request returned cached results with no Waldo. It turns out that with the default caching strategy, the cache has no way of knowing which requests to invalidate when a new record is added. Fortunately, we can enable something called a cache policy to eliminate this problem. A cache policy tells the cache handler how to know when a cached request should be considered expired. You can enable a cache policy by setting the lifetimes property on the warp drive store to the cache policy instance. Warp drive's toolbox includes a pre-built basic cache policy that determines staleness based on the time since the request was last received from the API. The logic for the toolbox cache policy is simple. It calculates the age of the cache request using the date header. If the date is too far in the past, then the cache request will be considered either soft or hard expired. If the cache request is hard expired, a subsequent matching request will not resolve until it is handled by the configured request handlers, at which point the cache will be updated. In our example, this would happen when the request is 60 seconds old. This is the same behavior as if we'd set reload to true for the request. If the cache request is soft expired, a subsequent matching request will resolve immediately with the cache response. But the new request will be handled by the request handlers in the background, and the cache will update when this new request resolves. In our example, this would happen when the request is 30 seconds old. This is the same behavior as if we'd set background reload to true for the request. Additionally, the toolbox cache policy will also expire the cache request if it knows that there has been a relevant change of remote state. While updates and deletes can still be automatically emerged into the existing cache, creating new records will invalidate cache requests for the same type. If any create re record request is successful, existing cache requests for the same record type will be considered hard expired. Hey, there's Waldo. Let's look at this in code. Here, we have a simple query for users and their pets. If we want this request to be invalidated, anytime that a new user is created, we can specify that in cache options. In fact, if you use Warp Drive's provided builders, they will include the primary type of the request by default. If we want, however, we can invalidate when new pets are created as well. We can then associate any create record requests with the relevant types by including cache options there as well. When this create record request succeeds, any cache re requests that have registered themselves with the user type, including our get request for users and their pets, will be hard expired. And as with the get request, if we use Warp Drive's included builders, we don't need to include the, the type, types cache option for our create record request either, because again, the included request builders will infer the types. Once this create record request successfully resolves, our get request for users and their pets will once again be invalidated, this time because both the user and the pet types were invalidated. 
If the pre-built toolbox cache policy doesn't provide the features that you need, you can create your own cache policy. This is a huge improvement over previous versions of Ember data, where you had very little control over caching behavior. All you need to do is to implement the cache policy interface. The is hard expired and is soft expired hooks allow you to implement custom hard and soft expiration logic. Optionally, you can also implement will request and did request hooks, which allow you to adjust the policy based on which requests are in progress or have already occurred. Your request policy can even be a service with access to current app state. For example, if the user logs out, you can automatically invalidate all cached requests. So that's cache control. Next, let's talk about the schema. Thanks. Schema record is the next generation of working with reactive data. We introduced the idea of schema record at EmberConf last year, where we were still calling it schema model. But here's a quick TLDR. When you make a request using the store, warp drive will insert the API response into the cache. The raw JSON for this document and the associated resources is then stored by the cache. That's what makes it a cache. The cache splits apart the response into information about what the response contained, the document, and individual cacheable entities within it, resources. While we could work with raw JSON in our applications, it wouldn't react to updates or changes, and it might not be in the exact shape that is useful to the UI. This is where schema record comes in. Schema record, I went too far on that one, sorry. But schema record uses our schemas to take data out of the cache and transform it into the shape we want for the UI, making it reactive in the process. Where model had limited one-dimensional capabilities for describing the shape of your data, Schema record has no such limitation. Data can be well-structured, reactive, and relational at arbitrary depths. This means that schema record is not just a replacement for a model, but a replacement for model fragments as well. Over the past year, we've made significant progress on schema record, though there's still much to do in order to make, the, make it part of the core experience. These are the rough milestones at which schema record will reach the key levels of maturity that we care about. Today, we're rapidly approaching a Canary version that supports most of the basic functionality that we want, but without much of the polish. There's still a lot of work to be done, and please reach out to any core team member if you'd like to be involved in that. So that's schema record. And this is warp drive. This new journey has only just begun, and we left a ton of new and coming soon features out of this talk today in the interest of time. But we hope you're excited as we are. Thanks. Thank you.